morning and good afternoon to in-house counsel from all across North America and the world. Um, welcome to In-House Connect. My name is Shai Mahani. I am the CEO and co-founder of In-House Connect, and I'm thrilled to have you here with us today. Thank you for spending your breakfast time or your lunch time with us. And special thanks to our wonderful sponsor, Baker Bots, and our fantastic, a rock star panel today of Maggie Welsh, Nicole Spence, and Ndidi Ilu for putting together a fantastic pre presentation on key considerations for in-house counsel when leveraging artificial intelligence. For those of you who are here for the first time, let me give you a quick bit of background on In-House Connect. In-House Connect started 11 years ago as a New York City-based meetup group for in-house counsel. Every month, In-House Connect would organize free CLE classes, which were hosted by different law firms. And every six months, we would organize fun and festive networking mixers. Over the years, we've helped thousands of in-house counsel connect with peers and outside counsel alike. The group was humming along, and then, of course, COVID hit. We couldn't meet in person, so we went online, which has been a fantastic transition. We've been able to attract a much larger audience of in-house counsel from coast to coast, and we've been able to feature high-caliber speakers like the rock star panel we have today, who I'm going to introduce in just a few moments. This is actually our 39th event of the year. And I'm wondering, are you here for the first time or have you been with In-House Connect or attended an In-House Connect event before? Looks like 40% are new visitors and about 60% are returning. So thank you so much to the 40% for joining us and giving us a try. And welcome back to the 60%. It's great to have you with us. So no more um, housekeeping announcements for me. And let's get to today's event, Ethics for In-House Counsel, Key Considerations When Leveraging Artificial Intelligence. Our panelists today are Maggie Welsh, Nicole Spencer, and Ndidi Ilu. Maggie Welsh is an experienced patent attorney and helps companies solve complex technology issues. Drawing from her 10 plus years of patent litigation, technology transaction, and patent prosecution, Maggie is able to, under to quickly understand underlying issues and provide thoughtful and thorough advocacy for her clients. Whether she is litigating a patent or reviewing technology transaction agreements, Maggie sees the landscape of potential risks and provides her clients with tactics to address them. Maggie's background includes consulting with companies on strategic and technical improvements for their products. With an engineering background and industry knowledge, Maggie immerses herself in emerging technologies such as robotics, clean technologies, batteries, energy, electronics, semiconductors, and biomedical devices. Our next panelist is Nicole Spence. Nicole is a brand legal counsel for IBM's data and AI business unit, as well as one of IBM's AI policy attorneys for North America. She's also a certified information privacy professional in the US and the EU. In addition to her brand and policy roles at IBM, she also advises on data usage and governance issues and IBM's music licenses, and she provides legal support for M&A deals. Nicole was recognized as one of Diversity Journal's 2021 Black Leaders Worth Watching, and she is a 2022 Leadership Council on Diversity Fellow. Prior to IBM, Nicole practiced as a litigator for more than seven years, managing all phases of, of litigation, including discovery, settlement agreements, and trials in IP and insurance defense. She also had her own practice where she advised startups in fintech, music, culinary arts, fashion, and software sectors on IP and corporate matters. Last but certainly not least, our final panelist, panelist is Ndidi Ilu. Ndidi is a Nigerian-American tech attorney who is currently lead counsel for artificial intelligence at Meta. Her legal career has consistently focused on the intersection of technology and the law. Her experience includes practice in the fields of responsible and ethical AI, intellectual property, technology transactions, and data privacy and security. She received her BS in, uh, in computer science and her JD from Loyola, Loyola University, Chicago. We have nothing short of a rock star panel today. And with that, I'll turn things over to Maggie to get us started. Great, thanks so much, Shai. And yes, hi, I'm Maggie Welsh, I'm with Baker Butts, and I'm happy to be here today. Thanks everyone for joining. So in 2019, police showed up at a scene of an incident of a shoplifting, um, a shoplifting incident in Woodbridge, New Jersey. And the suspect had fled the scene and no arrests were made that day. Weeks later, a man by the name of Najir Parks noticed that a warrant was out for his arrest. He was confused because he had never been to Woodbridge, New Jersey before. Parks went to the police station to clear his name, and at that time he was handcuffed and he spent 10 days in jail. What happened was Najir Parks was misidentified by facial recognition software 
and the AI algorithms that were used in that facial recognition software that were being used by the New Jersey police at that time. The charges against Mr. Parks were later dismissed, but he spent about a year fighting those charges and clearing his names. AI used in facial recognition software now is notoriously biased and less accurate against non-white skin tones. And you may have seen Google back in May, they introduced a 10 skin tone palette as opposed to their six skin tone palette for their facial recognition algorithms to help combat some of the racial biases that were seen in their facial recognition algorithms. The, and you may not think that algorithms could be biased because after all, they're just equations, but there's numerous examples of AI raising ethical issues. And as attorneys, whether we're developing AI products or using AI in our legal analysis, it's important to start to recognize these issues, see where they're coming from, um, so we can start to ask the right questions. So as Shai said, we have a rock star panel today. Uh, Nicole Spence and, and, and Didia Liu are with us. And I'm going to turn it over to the panelists so they can introduce themselves um, in their own words and say how they're using AI and dealing with some of these ethical issues. So Nicole, do you want to go ahead and say hi? Sure. Hello, everyone. So generally, um, a lot of my work is more or less working on selling AI models to third parties. Um, internally, I do not use AI models as much. Um, a lot of my work with AI models is on my own personal time, um, such as if anyone uses Netflix <laughs> to know exactly if it was a recommended movie or not. That's how we use AI. I use AI a lot in that respect. But as far as my everyday job or everyday work, um, typically, AI models are primarily used to do more repetitive, redundant tasks. Um, so one thing we sometimes use AI models for is when you're dealing with um, office actions um, to know exactly what division that office action or the office action is going to go to. Um, and also any repetitive like M&A due diligence tasks primarily. But it's a pleasure to be on the panel. Hello, everyone. Great. Thanks. And, and Didi? Hello everyone, my name is Ndidi, like yes Ndidi, um, in case anybody was wondering how to pronounce it. I, I am currently lead counsel at Meta, specifically on the AI legal team. Um, there I support a team called Responsible AI, and I like to call them the Responsible AI consultants for the company. They develop a bunch of best practices and guidelines and measurement methodologies, things in that space that will enable other teams across the company to either develop their different AI um, or ML model systems more ethically, or um, to just set out processes that the entire company can eventually leverage um, as we're moving into this space where regulations are likely coming to be in this space. My team is helping the company build out um, rules and policies that will support responsible AI efforts scaling across the company. Great, thanks. So Nicole and Didi are our experts today. So please feel free to ask questions as you go through. And as um, Shai said, you can put them in the chat and then we can address them as they come through. Or there's a Q&A at the end as well. So just a brief um, disclaimer, the presentation re represents our personal views and not the views of our firms or organizations. So we're gonna start off with our first polling question for the group to um, get to know everyone a little bit better. So how do you use artificial intelligence in your current job? Uh, do you develop AI products? Do you use products and services that use AI in your legal work? Or you're not sure what is AI, you're just here for the ethics credit. So go ahead and fill that in. I see the polls are coming in and it looks like we have a good diverse group here. Um, about 18% have developed AI products or working on developing AI products. And we will try to cover some of the practical tips and ethical issues to think about when you're looking at developing AI or acquiring AI products. Um, the majority of you, 58%, use products and services that use AI, and I think that's pretty typical of the legal world that we're in now, where you see AI being used in a number of um, analytics and research and different predictive analysis. Um, and then 23% of you aren't sure what AI is, and that's great, too. We are going to start from um, the basics and go through what AI is and how, it might, how you might see it, how it might come up in your work. 
Okay, so here's a roadmap of today. Like I said, we'll start off with the basics. What is AI, how it's being used? Then we'll look at the practical ethical considerations, and then we'll turn to the policies and some strategies behind ethical AI. So what is AI? And I think there's a lot of definitions of AI and there's a lot of different definitions of AI. Um, for me, it's helpful to think about a computer actually being trained and um, being changing as it's getting data and getting analytics into it, as opposed to a computer just being programmed to perform a logical function. Um, and, you know, one of the definitions that we've seen is that AI is a method of technology that teaches machines how to do a task originally thought to be carried out by humans. Um, and so if you have a pro computer program that matches patterns to a predetermined categories, you know, the question on the screen is whether that is AI. And I think it really depends if that that um, computer program is changing and if it's matching or if it's just looking at the data before and doing um, analysis based on what's already in the database. However, if a computer uses algorithms that continuously learn such that, out that outcomes are redefined as data volume increases, then you start to get into the realms of AI where the computer is learning and it's con constantly changing based on the data. And you see AI is being used everywhere today. It's hard to, you know, turn on the news without hearing an AI story or uh, an instance where AI was used in a good or bad way. And the USPTO published a report um, and it said from 2012 to 2018, AI applications increased more than 100%. So in 2000, sorry, in 2002, the um, patent applications were about 30% of AI patent applications. Um, and then in um, 2018, that increased to 60,000 patent applications. So it was 30,000 patent applications in 2002. And then in 2018, that increased to 60,000 patent applications. And I'm sure that it's even exponentially grown um, today. And so it's not only, you know, AI is becoming more prevalent, but it's diffusing into all sectors of technology. And so I wanted to turn it back over to the panelists to talk about some of their examples, their favorite examples of AI, um, maybe AI being used for good or some instances where you've seen AI um, having some issues and, and some concerns that were raised there. So Ndidi, do you wanna start? Um, give your favorite example or not so favorite example of AI? Yeah, sure. I mean, as everyone knows, AI is used all over uh, social media apps, it's used in advertising, smart cars today with traveling and navigation, finding flights, all those types of things. Um, for me, I'm a big music person. So I love like Spotify, YouTube. Um, Spotify kind of knows what songs I want to hear next every single time. Um, in addition to YouTube, right? You start watching a couple of videos in a certain space and suddenly it just keeps delivering you all the type of videos um, that you're looking for. Uh, to me, those are the most, I guess, user-friendly or like positive um, uses of AI. But as we know, there is also uses of AI that may negatively impact people like the one Maggie mentioned at the beginning of the call, um, AI being used in the criminal justice system to determine sentencing. However, the AI was not even trained properly on the right sets of data or may be biased against certain types of um, defendants versus others. Um, but ultimately, I think that AI in general is a great way to move innovation forward um, and to kind of speed up a lot of the things that we were previously doing manually. We just need to incorporate doing it ethically and responsibly from the beginning and even after the fact, continuing to monitor and, and revise existing um, uses of AI in various products. Great. And Nicole, what about you? So I don't mean to be the gloom and doom person here, but there are, I mean, you all know examples of AI kind of in essence, um, you know, having issues and not working as ethically or, or in essence, having some bias that disproportionately affects one group versus the others. A good example that's been kind of flagged on the federal level has been mortgage rates. AI models are used to determine whether what the mortgage rates are for one person versus another. In essence, you at one point you had an underwriter who did a lot of that work, but now AI model did a lot of it as well. And based upon various factors, determine um, who gets one rate versus another. That's been flagged as an issue where um, certain groups, regardless of 
financial income and, and, and job security and so forth have been flagged as getting higher rates or not a really good um, candidate for a mortgage than others. Another example that was kind of flagged during COVID was AI models were being used to determine um, hospital beds and ventilator availabilities in versus certain hospitals. And there was an issue because unfortunately, the data that was put into the models were not adequate. Um, and therefore, it was in essence providing incorrect information, where it was saying some hospitals did not have available ventilators or available hospital beds, when in, in some cases they did. So that's something that in essence is, is kind of a very um, a more recent thing. But to kind of switch, I'd like to end on the positive note, areas in which AI models um, have been quite positive have been, they've been used with the U.S. to determine proper areas to get water resources for some um, some communities that may have, um, you know, water or drought issues. Um, they've also been used to track and control the spread of the Zika virus. So AI, as Ndidi also said as well, has some really good positive uses in our lives as well. Great. So what, whenever you're, you know, whether you're looking at Spotify, Netflix, or um, tracking the Zika virus, you might encounter AI. And I think that's a great example as it show the widespread use of AI and how it just uh, comes into our everyday lives. So, um, Nicole, why don't you talk us through now we have some examples of AI, we know that it's in our lives and we would be seeing it. Um, how does AI work, you know, how does an AI model uh, mm -hmm. run? This is a very simple um, way of how an AI model works, but I like to kind of use it with a problem because obviously the whole point of an AI model is to find a solution to a problem. So let's start off with a problem. How long will it take me to travel from home to work at 7 a.m. Tuesday morning. So as Maggie talked about earlier on, an AI model, the main purpose of an AI model is in essence to do tasks that a human being would do using human intelligence and discernment. So for a human, for us, our problem A is how to get from home to work at 7 a.m. on Tuesday. We would say, okay, that's our problem. And we use our own personal experience and information, such as a coworker who lives three blocks away. How long does it take him or her to get to work? Um, our experience of traveling, getting to work at 7 a.m. Based on what we heard as far as whether school's in session or not, whether school buses are going to be on the road. We use all information to determine, okay, how long would it take us? If normally it's 30 minutes with no traffic, we might have some traffic with only probably 40 minutes, depending upon those various parameters. However, an AI model doesn't have that knowledge bank of experiences and coworkers to rely upon to get that information. So that's a move to number two on this chart, which is data or AI input. In essence, where they use data to feed in this model to in essence, create that, that experience, that information, that knowledge base to in essence, determine the time to solve the problem. So number three is running the AI. So that's where you use the algorithms that Maggie talked about earlier on. You'd use the data and you in essence create an output. Number four is assessing that output. So now a human gets involved. Okay, so it's we, our problem was how long it takes me to travel from home to work at 7 a.m. on Tuesday morning. Let's say generally, the, generally it takes me 30 minutes. Let's say the data model's output is 30 days. Clearly something is very wrong. So now a human will get involved and say, okay, what was wrong? Is it A, maybe the, the parameters, such as the address from my home and my address to my work is not correct. Maybe they're looking at me walking to work as opposed to driving or taking a train to work. They look at various parameters. Is the data correct? Is the data in essence looking at the right time period, the right time of day to travel into work? That's what you call assessing the output and doing a feedback mechanism based upon if the output is completely off base, in essence, will get new data, rerun the model, tweak the parameters, figure out what's wrong, and go back to step two on this chart, which is AI input, in which you might input more data, change parameters, they move to number three, where we think we got all the parameters right, we think we got correct data, we're going to run the AI model based on the algorithm, then number four happens again, we assess the output. Let's say now it's saying it's 40 minutes to get from home to work at 7 a.m. on Tuesday. That's more in the line of probably reasonable. Um, so now the human can say, all right, that looks like it could be a possible solution to the problem. So now we have number five, a solution to the problem. So in essence, we went one, two, three, four, five. And that's in essence how an AI model works. 
Great. Thanks, Nicole. And one of the questions came up in the chat, and I think we'll talk about it when we talk about bias, but something related to what you just said now is yeah. the data. It sounds like AI is very focused on data and analyzing the data. So where does that data typically come from? Um, could you talk about some of the examples of where, where you might pull that data from? Sure. It depends on who the, who's creating the model. Sometimes you may generate your own data, whether in this case, the problem as far as going to work, asking various coworkers, how long did it take you to get to work on that day, depending on where you live? Um, you also can get data from third parties. That's actually a very common way. Some cases, some companies can create their own data. In other cases, they can generate that data from online sources from the federal government. They have a wealth of data, federal government as well, depending on what you're using it for. So you can have various sources in which you can get data from. But data really is, for an AI model, garbage in, garbage out. Data really is like the heart of the model. Just want to add with, with respect to racial bias testing, which the question or the, the person that um, asked the question also mentioned, um, we at Meta recently announced a, an approach to racial bias measurement testing in um, AI models for fairness. So there's a lot of public material um, out there on how to do it. The key is really just respecting the privacy of those that you're working with or the, the data that you're seeking to collect, whether that is um, using de-identification techniques or anonymization techniques or simply finding um, adjacent data, not proxies, but adjacent data that can be used to enable the same type of measurements. Because as we know, a lot of companies, as you mentioned, don't have this data and it's quite sensitive to even collect and maybe users won't want to provide it. So there are a lot of ways that that you know, companies are still conducting these type of measurements without having access to the raw data. Okay, so let's talk about how attorneys are using AI, and I'm sure you've seen in your um, work, you know, AI in the legal profession has really increased through e-discovery, doing predictive coding or litigation analysis, doing legal research. Um, you might have seen in 2016, there was talk of a first AI attorney being hired, the Ross attorney, who was doing the, you know, Westlaw research and some of the data gathering that a first year or a junior associate might have been doing. Um, and so I think AI is, we're being used, using it in our legal profession all the time now, whether you are in the space of developing AI or not. Um, so a question for the panel, for Nicole and Ndidi, you know, how are you using AI in your work? Um, and do you think that AI will replace attorneys in the future? Do you think that we will have, you know, the more AI hires, legal hires? Um, and Nicole, do you want to start with that one? In the near future, no. I think we have job security as attorneys here. But um, but one area that I know that we've used AI models for is um, when you're drafting patent applications in order to determine appropriate office action responses, to determine exactly what part or what group or office of the USPT or your application would, would in essence fall under and what the success rate is passing based upon your application and, and, and where your application stacks amongst the, amongst the many others. So that's a really common area. Another area is um, in due diligence as far as um, determining what is still missing within due diligence process based upon what you, you should be getting from your, your target as well. That's an area which we've used AI models for also to, to pick out um, important information or words within a thousand plus documents. Um, AI models are used for that as well. And for me, I actually do not use AI in my day-to-day -day practice. However, as you can imagine, working at Meta, a lot of, I mean, everything else that my that I do or that I touch is, is about the evaluation of, of AI as it's used in the company. Um, I previously used to work at Uber, um, specifically in the Uber freight division. And I saw someone here is from UShip. And if you know, transportation related agreements are extremely hard to negotiate because there's a lot of non, <laughs> things that are not even written down on paper that go into the negotiation styles and, and getting to a, a resolution between both parties. And I remember our um, sales team at the time when I was at Uber wanting us to use this automated software because they thought that would speed up our ability to review shipper contracts and, and negotiate with the other sides. When in all actuality, you need humans in that process to actually reach a resolution. It's a very relationship-based type of um, I guess industry 
And a lot of the terms depend on what is being shipped, right? The goods that are being shipped in that instance. So there was just no way for us to incorporate the software. And um, I remember us testing it out on a, a sample contract and it was actually horrible. <laughs> the type of issues it flagged were not necessarily substantive issues. Um, also people draft different, draft certain provisions differently and the software was really wasn't picking that up. Um, so I too also don't agree that, you know, any of these types of things that are meant to replace or mimic what attorneys are doing in their day to day will ever be, well, for the foreseeable future will not be as effective as an attorney. But as we know, innovation um, is what makes the world go round. And every year there's new more and more advances, but I do not think that um, these AI systems can truly replace what a human um, attorney would need to do in so many of these different situations. Yeah, and one thing indeed that we'll talk about too later on is it, holding people accountable, right? And what you are um, doing, supervising, if you're using AI, how you're, as an attorney, what your obligations are to supervise the AI and monitor the AI um, that you're using. And so, you know, I think at some point there's always going to be an attorney that kind of needs to have that oversight there, like Nicole was mentioning in the model too. You need some sort of human to do the assessment and make sure that everything is working as it's supposed to be doing. Um, and so quick question for the um, audience, if you can put in the chat, um, how often are you using AI in your work? Are you skeptical about autofilling documents and analytics because you don't know about this poor data set, which I promise we'll come back to? Um, mm -hmm. Are you only using it for certain repetitive tasks or using it every chance you get? Um, you love the automation and the efficiency that it provides. So. We're getting a lot of ones and twos um, in the chats, which is interesting. Couple fives, fours. I think the highest I've seen is, oh, there's a 10. Okay. A couple of tens now. Okay, great. Well, whether you are skeptical about using AI or you use it all the time, as I mentioned when we started, it's helpful to start to think about some of the issues that we've already started to talk about, about bias and the data that comes in. So let's turn it over now to ethics and we'll go through some of the ethical rules um, and talk about some of these issues that come up. When we're talking about the ethics and the model rules, um, model rule point one talks about competent representation and to keep aware of the changes in the law. And I think this really is twofold for the in the AI context. You know, it's as attorneys, it's our obligation to know about the issues that may come up with AI if you start using AI and using AI in certain ways, um, but also to know, you know, whether using AI could provide benefits and efficiencies for your clients and start to seek out certain AI solutions that um, might provide those efficiencies um, and where to use them. The ABA had a resolution um, when they met in 2019 um, at their annual meeting. Their House of Delegates provided this resolution 112, which urged um, lawyers and courts to address emerging and ethical legal issues related to AI, to look at bias, explainability, transparency, um, ethical and beneficial uses of AI, and as I mentioned earlier, those controls and oversights of AI. So when you thought thinking about um, AI, we'll go to our next polling question. You know, what are the biggest legal ethical issues that you're concerned about AI? I know bias has come come up a lot. Is that one of the um, main concerns that you have or confidentiality, privacy, transparency, or ownership? And Shai, do you wanna set up a poll for this one? 36, 37% are looking at confidentiality and privacy, which as in DD, I know we'll talk about and has talked about, you know, getting the data and anonymizing the data and figuring out how you can get a good set of data is really one of the challenges with this AI. Um, and then bias, you know, once you have the data, looking at the data and making sure that it's giving you the right outcomes um, that you want. So we will talk about all these issues today. Um, yeah, if you have the other concerns, please put those in the chat and we can try to address those too as well. Okay, great. 
Okay, so the first one we're going to talk about today on everyone's mind is bias. Um, so the model rule 8.4G um, says that as attorneys, we cannot re reasonably engage in conduct, in conduct that discriminates. So when we're using AI, it's important to be aware where bias can creep in to recognize that, you know, in the criminal context and even in your legal research, knowing, you know, how bias can creep into some of those data sets. So turning it over to the panel, um, Nicole and Ndidi, how do you identify and, av and avoid bias um, when you're using AI models? And Nicole, do you wanna start with that one? Sure, there's a lot of different areas where bias can creep into an AI model, but um, the first area I always focus on is data, data, data. Where's the data coming from? What, how's data being selected? Um, are we getting a wealth of data? What's the quality of the data? Where is the, what's the data source? These are all areas you have to look at um, to determine whether your data is what you call quote unquote, good quality data. I always use an example as well of even good quality data can have their flaws. Like for example, if you're trying to see who in essence would be a great candidate for a cruise, you're not gonna get data on yacht owners. I mean, yes, they're both boats, but <laughs> different kinds of boats and different types of uses and purposes, depending upon who's on either one. So you gotta be, and it might be good quality data on yacht owners, but it's not gonna be applicable to cr potential cruisers in the future. So I, you have to look at all of those premises. What's data being used for? Is it accurate for your particular problem to solve your problem? Another thing to be also very mindful of is that sometimes historical data can be inherently flawed. For example, um, you have a situation where let's say you're trying to figure out um, uh, hospital rates, survival rates for particular disease. Um, in the past, certain groups were less likely to go to the hospital unless it was really serious, you know, versus other groups were more likely to go to the hospital. Maybe they had better health care, so they weren't going to pay out of pocket for the visit, whatever it may be. So therefore, that data is going to be flawed. Is a data really a good canvas of all people, of all groups and populations? There's a lot of things you have to look at to determine if it's really good quality data. Um, there are also, I just want to also say, um, as thinking about a way to identify bias, there are also AI models that have been trained to detect bias, um, you know, to kind of look, assess the output and see if there's a problem there or something of that sort. Um, so you can also look for a particular technology or models that can also do it as well to help deal with detecting bias, identifying bias, and figuring out how you can mitigate that bias. And Ndidi, the same question for you too. And one of the questions that popped up in the chat, which maybe you could talk about too, is the, what do you mean by adjacent data that you talked about before um, and how companies go about sourcing that and using data for training models? To answer that question, I saw it as well. I think a good place to start is the, um, like the US Census Bureau. They actually have a lot of different data products that uh, people can use in um, using to measure, measure their you know, given AI ML products for equity, for example, they have a lot of demographic data that is not necessarily tied to any individuals, but that will still help you depending on what, you know, depending on what you're specifically measuring for. Um, as we know, they collect data such as race, ethnicity, um, sex, disability, income status, um, veteran status, and all these, these, these data sets are publicly made available. Um, I think it's very key to have like data analytics or analysis type professionals to help you um, first understand the type of data that's available and also determine what type of measurements can be done to even understand um, the models and the AI and how they perform across the, the different demographics that or different demographic data that is being provided by the census data and similar data sets. Um, but in regards to this question, I also agree. I feel like the first step is always data. Um, and for me, I always think of as the data sets representative. And I'm not many people think about the data they're using to build AI, whether it's training or after the fact retraining. Um, it's not something that's, that's brought up in engineering school, for example. You're not really taught to think about whether the data set you're using to build a particular model is representative of maybe the issue you're trying to solve for or the from from a product point of view from the or the users you're trying to impact. Um, so that's a big thing for me. But also measurement as well. Um, I think that every if you're if you're using AI as in from a product point of view or even if you're purchasing an AI system or some type of AI enabled system for some work that you're doing, whether in your practice or not, I would be very curious to hear about the practices 
of that, you know, party you're purchasing for as it relates to measurement. Are they during the product development cycle, are they actually measuring the impact of this model across different potentially sensitive di dimensions, meaning sensitive characteristics or protective characteristics, for example, or whatever the, the actual model is like, supposed to do? Are they measuring during the product development cycle how their AI works? Even after the fact, it's already existing, it's been out in the world for three, four years. Are they constantly improving and iterating and finding ways to improve their model? Or are they just letting it ship? without any like remediation being done. Because as we know, AI is only as good as the data it learns. And as AI and ML models are actually out in, in you know, the world or in the product or whatever, um, they're learning from, from the experiences or, or it's learning from the experiences or the examples that it's encountering. Mm -hmm. And so it's very key to have a measurement plan, right? Either before or after or both actually, um, so that you're able to understand, measure, and then, and then take a step further and potentially mitigate or remediate any issues that you find. Very interesting. And how do you find out about that measurement plan? Is that just something that's disclosed when you're talking to companies or is that through an audit? How would that work? I don't even know if like, people ask that type of question, um, but because of my work at Meta, right, that's something I would ask. Now, I, you know, previously I used to do transactional work. And as I think I've seen some questions about like around that in the chat, like around data and, you know, when you're just purchasing a product from a company, what do you ask them to rep and warrant to? But it's only because of my experience now that I'm now looking back like, wow, I would totally ask these type of questions. And can these comp like companies provide me some type of guarantee or warranty that the data that the model that I'm purchasing or the software that I'm purchasing was actually done in the right way? I think also from the customer side, if more and more customers are asking these type of questions of these corporations, they're likely going to change their practices or find a way to contract around them, <laughs> but hopefully change their practices um, and, and ask the, you know, their developers or their engineers, like, how did you build this? How, to what step or to what um, length can we actually guarantee a particular outcome or not? Cool, very interesting. And you mentioned the contracts a little bit, and I think that's our next question for you, Nicole. You know, despite the good intentions, the use of AI can result in bias. I think we all know that. So are there some ways that we can combat that contractually when you're looking at uh, working with AI models or acquiring AI data? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so first thing is everything kind of comes back into our contract to your reps and warranties. Who's doing what and who's responsible for what? I think that's the whole point of reps and warranties. And that's an era where you can in essence kind of really, the person who's providing the AI model, what their responsibility level is, as far as are they you know, making sure they're responsible to mitigate any bias to a certain percentage if possible. Um, also, what are they doing internally to test to make sure that they're constantly updating their model and testing that the bias Bias has been mitigated in some way. Um, and then also responsibly the person using the AI model. If they notice a problem, are they do they have any kind of responsibility to notify the, the actual company that created the AI model to make sure that, oh, hey, we noticed an issue in one of the outputs. This is a bias issue. You know, you guys should really look into that, include that in your next round of testing or something of that sort. So some accountability in that respect as well. Next thing, protocols and procedures. I mean, the laws are changing a lot nowadays and a lot of laws that with, between the EU and the US um, that are in talking about having some kind of protocol or procedure for the not just the crazy person developing the model, but those deploying the model as well. So really making sure that you, whether you're the one creating the model or you're the one using the model, you're very well aware of the protocols and procedures that you both have to be accountable for. Are you getting training on how the model is working? Are you getting training on how it's being deployed? Are you getting training on how it's being tested, advice are being mitigated? What's the time schedule? All that has to be fully fleshed out. And in some cases, if it's not put within an agreement, there has to be something supplemental so you know what's going on as well to protect yourself. Transparency, I can't say that enough. Uh, both parts be transparent what the party is doing. Whether you're the one using the model, you need to be transparent with the person creating the model, what you're using model for, because that can be problematic as well, as we all know. And also, you need to be transparent as far as how the model is being tested. Um, accountability, I talked about that before. Who's accountable for what? Um, who's responsible for what? Making sure the actual agreement makes that very clear, the reps and warranties. Because the last thing you want is for it to get some kind of um, 
regulatory um, notice from the FTC or someone else sitting as a problem with the model, the way you're deploying the model, and you're not knowing who's accountable to change what and what's going on on the other side of the of the negotiation table. So. Okay, and one of the questions that just came into the chat that I think is interesting is, is there a standard to which we can get the developers to sort of build these AI models to have you seen any standard like that or um, any sort of, um, you know, threshold where some of these procedures of accountability and, you know, checking the model are being held as sort of the baseline? Nothing as of yet. I mean, at this point, since there's no requirement um, on the federal level, and even in the EU, the law is still kind of being worked on for the AI Act. There is nothing, there's no standard on a government or legislative area of what everyone has to follow. So it does kind of come down to individual company, kind of what their internal policies are and what um, they can are willing to do. So a lot of times um, there is nothing that has like a particular standard we all can agree to. In the agreement though, you can agree to it on a case by case basis, what each party is comfortable with. And that's typically the, the extent of what you have as a baseline. Yeah, I, I agree from, from a legal point of view, there aren't any laws that we can look to that will say, these are the laws that these developers need to comply with. However, from a policy standpoint, there's there's actually lots and lots of literature and like um, research that's been done in this space. The field of ethical AI or responsible AI in general really doesn't come from the law, right? It comes from mm -hmm. our policy partners. So if you are working in this space from either a purchasing point of view or even a product development point of view, it's actually very, very important that the, the team you have working on these type of issues is very um, multidisciplinary, whether it's ethicists or having policy, uh, key policy makers or even policy professionals help you navigate these issues. As, as we mentioned right now, it's not legal. There's no legal requirements, but we're getting there. And in my day-to-day, -day, my policy team, they're my best friends, quite literally. Um, I'm so I feel super lucky to even be working with them because they've been pushing for these type of things for so long. And now we see the regulations finally catching up. And so um, as you're working in this space, major, I would, I would recommend looking up, you know, similar or, like companies like IBM, even Meta, Google, we've all published externally responsible AI or ethical AI related tenants or practices. And if you look at them, they are uniformly the same. They have four or five key areas. And I think generally that would be something to ask um, a company that maybe you're seeking to purchase something for about if they follow these type of standards, because look at the big, the big players in the space are, are incorporating um, those practices into their work. Mm -hmm. Great. Thanks so much for answering that. Um, let's turn to the next one on confidentiality and privacy, which we've talked about um, briefly already. So confidentiality model rule point one, model rule 1 1.6 as you as an attorney, you're supposed to make reasonable efforts to prevent the inadvertent or unauthorized disclosure of information related to representing your client. So when you're dealing with AI and you're using AI services, um, it's important to think about the client data that you might be turning over to an AI party um, or some proprietary data that maybe an AI party would use. Um, and Nicole and, and Didi, um, a question for you, you know, what are some of the ways to mitigate the confidentiality and privacy risks that you've seen um, you know, with AI and some of the regulations that you've touched on. And Didi, do you want to start with that? Yeah, sure. I know that Nicole and I will both agree and probably any privacy attorney, but honestly, consent and notice is the best way to get mm -hmm. um, the type of, you know, approval you'll need to use data. Um, at Meta, right, there's a huge resource, like arm of the company of the AI organization. And it's very key to kind of have a review process, right, that you're able to understand the type of data sets that the researchers may want to use. This is purely for research purposes, right? There's tons and tons of data out there that's released by major institutions, um, academic institutions and similar, and they all have licensing requirements. And it's very key to actually pay attention to what those licensing requirements require, because a lot of the time um, they explicitly call out like not, it's not for non, uh, not for commercial use, right? So, you know, looking to, what are the actual terms that accompany the data sets? That's key. Whether you're trying to collect the data yourself, you have to be mindful of the GDPR, of course. And in the US, our, our favorite CCPA, California um, laws and what 
does de-identification mean in that context? What does personal data mean in that context? Because it's actually not clear <laughs> and it can get very tricky um, if you're trying to collect data in the US or you know, as a business that operates in the US and you have California um, potential data or user data. Mm -hmm. No, agreed. I completely agree with Ndidi 110% on that. We are really big on in essence, getting data from third parties. So a lot of what we do is also creating controls or data that we're bringing in. Because once you bring it in-house, it has its own bag of issues. So you, in essence, want to be very careful as far as our big thing is privacy and PI, privacy and PI. So um, making sure that, in essence, there is any, any privacy issues have been resolved and vetted. Um, that's huge um, before that data is brought in to within our, our company and within our servers. Also being mindful of who's working on what and where. It doesn't, it doesn't probably dawn on anyone, but it's really important where your developers are working out of because and where servers are located at as well, because that can trip different privacy laws as well. Um, so for example, if you have developers working out of I don't know, a, a example, Romania, there may be certain laws there that we need to be mindful of if they're, if they're in essence saving the data in a Romanian server. So we also have to be mindful of who's working on what, where as well. To follow on on that, are there any special issues associated when you're looking at acquiring an AI related mm -hmm. target, you know, through diligence or looking at some of those confidentiality provisions? Oh yeah, this is a, when you're dealing with M and A and acquiring a, a target AI related company, it's it's a whole bag of of issues you have to look at to kind of narrow it down to four big things. Number one, in your due diligence, is there sufficient documentation available to back up what this AI model is doing and how it works? That's number one. Number two, understanding how the embedded AI works, what its purpose is. I cannot say this enough. When you are in essence um, dealing with uh, with AI models and understanding how it works, your product, technology, and dev team are your best friends because they're the experts in those areas. I mean, many of us don't have our PhD in these areas, but they do. And they're the ones that will know this acquiring targets product inside and out and be able to pinpoint what the issues are that you need to be zoning in on for a legal review. So that's that comes to say with, that's without saying with that um, verification, it's a way of auditing the information that on the AI model the target is providing and making sure that it aligns with the facts and documentation. A big area this comes up in is when you in essence have license agreements as far as employment agreements and third party contractor agreements. You gotta make sure that the ownership of the IP is clean. So you gotta make sure that the third party contractor and employee has no rights to own the IP relating to this AI model that you're applying to acquire from this target company and make sure if there's any loopholes, they are required to assign that over to the company without question. And you also be mindful of the laws in that jurisdiction in which that particular employer, third contractor resides or is employed in, because different laws have different I, um, IP rights that attach to them as well. So you got to very be very careful of that. And I'm a huge fan of doing also your own social media searching on the target. You know, obviously reviews are important. People are saying about the AI models important and making sure that that directly relates to what you're hearing as well. And last but surely not least is making sure they are compliant with the intended use. I know we talked a bit about facial recognition through all of this as well and, and, and GDPR, but making sure that if there's any regulatory requirements for the AI model, they have been complied with and followed to the T. The last thing anybody wants is a fine related to an acquisition. That's the last thing you want. You wanna make sure that's, that's very much ironed out and that's very clear and the policies and as far as the documentation behind it is very clear as well. And also making sure the intended use that this particular AI model has also comports with your internal company positions and policies. A lot of companies have made very strong positions on where they're using models for certain things or others. I know we talked earlier about facial recognition. Quite a few companies don't use um, certain AI models for that type of, of um, purpose. Making sure that what this acquiring company is using the model for relates to your company as well is super important. And, and it really is without saying. And one of the questions I think I saw come up in the chat sort of related to this is, you know, the regulatory landscape of AI is changing so much and uh, it's sort of 
evolving as just the technology is evolving. Do you find that as a deterrent for using AI or for companies to use AI or one of the challenges, just keeping you know abreast of what is going on and what those regulations require? No, I think if anything, that's what you have experts in that era, SMEs for, so there's been experts on. You, in essence, just really have to be very in tuned to them. I know Indeed talked about, you know, the internal policy team here and um, ethics team being very clear and making sure that you are very in tune to what's going on. Because the reality is a lot of these laws are things that we know that's going to pass um, long before they actually pass. So we kind of know the writing is on the wall with some changes here and there. So just being cognizant of that and talking to your team who are experts in that area. So you're making sure you're creating some buffer when you're acquiring a company to make sure that those particular laws can be complied with as well. Um, it's all about planning. I and mean, we all do that here in the legal world, prepare, prepare, prepare. Same thing applies when you're acquiring a target. And in this very changing landscape, you need to plan even more and be abreast of what's going on and have a good team around you to kind of help you. Great, thanks. And there's um, two other ethical issues I wanna touch on uh, quickly before we break. So the next one is transparency and explainability. And transparency and explainability, we've talked about, you know, and the question here is you have the algorithms, your AI is based on the algorithms, that's your proprietary software, the secret sauce of the AI. And how do you sort of um, balance that with the transparency and the explainability that's required to, you know, start to think about some of these ethical issues like bias and confidentiality. It's um, it's a balancing act. So, Nindidi, do you want to talk about some ways that you've seen um, companies ba balance the the transparency? Yeah, uh, most relevant for me are tools called a system cards or model cards. Um, a, system, a system card, for example, effectively explains how a machine learning AI system performs a, a specific task. And it's written in a way that a regulator can look at it and it has all the information they need that a regular person like my mom can look at it and understand how her data is flowing into the system, how it's making a decision and how the outcome is reached. Um, it's, it's a relatively new concept. It's similar to a data sheet for example, for a data set, but this is more user friendly. There could be diagrams or short like tutorials attached to this system card that will explain how this particular system is working. On the model card level, that is specifically about an AI model in general, how you know how it was built, how it was created, the data sets it was trained on, shortcomings potentially of the of the of the model itself, what recommended uses of the model, and also like non-recommended uses of the model. And the more the more and more companies are able to kind of adopt these practices internally as they're beginning to build versus, you know, after the fact where it's probably going to be harder to look back and figure out how a particular model was created and trained, especially it's been used quite some time. But it is an, an effort that a lot of companies are moving towards now as it lends directly to transparency and understandability for the average person and as well as regulators, um, especially on the policy side, there have been tons of roundtables and um, policy sort of um, led um, reports and research in this space as well. So I imagine as we move forward and regulations are changing and maybe a regula like a regulation will require some sort of explainability portion. I think that you know these system cards and model cards are going to be the way that the industry responds to that requirement. Um, moving forward. Very interesting. And those model cards, indeed, do those change as the algorithm changes, or do you just have like one model card um, for, you know? Set oh no, they they have to, they should be dy dynamic. If you Google them today, I know that Google has a, a couple of them available to look at, and obviously it's maintained on their website. So as that model may potentially change, it's updated. Maybe it's even deprecated. That model card will will be updated and say we no longer use this, but this is previously how we did. Um, so they have to be dy dynamic, unlike data sheets, right, right that accompany um, data sets when people download them from the internet. Yeah, that seems like such an important part, like the updating and constantly checking. And that brings us to our next, um, our next discussion of ethical considerations, looking at ownership and accountability. And 
who is responsible for the AI. You might have seen a recent Federal Circuit decision this month said that an AI can't be an owner of a patent. It's not a human being. Um, and so what we have AI, we have these models that are changing on their own, you know, with some human intervention, but generally working on their own. Um, and so it's important to think about who takes accountability when something goes wrong. And as attorneys, if we're using AI models, you know, what are we held accountable for using those AI models when something does go wrong? Um, so a question for Indeedee, you know, how do you start to hold people accountable for AI? And, um, you know, how do you how do you start to invoke this supervision on these AI models? Yeah, good question. I I I know that as a lawyer, we would wait for for some law to come um, to come out. But I think a lot of companies in general have this sort of, especially if they have end users that are real people. They 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 know that our the end users think about these type of things and care about these type of issues. So I can see how a, you know, potentially putting together policies internally that really will govern how a company interacts or deals with this type of responsible AI or ethical AI space would help push not only like development internally um, to be, to lean more in that, in that direction, but also externally. The more the, the bigger players are doing this type of thing, the more that others will incorporate it as well. And then maybe perhaps we'll one day get a law in the US, probably not, but you never know. Um, but I think that's where it starts. Um, it's having these type of practices and policies is just an example of being a good, I don't know what to call it, but like a good participant in this ecosystem, right? Of being a good innovator. And I think that's where it starts. Um, contractually, you know, my mind always goes back to my transactional days. It, you can spell out these things in an agreement, right? And often if you're a purchaser of, of, of something that is enabled by an AI, they, the lawyers on the other side or the company on the other side have already thought about it. So they've probably already limited their liability in all types of ways. And potentially maybe you don't want to agree with that. So I would look into it, right? I would actually ask more questions and perhaps even carve out certain type of um, instances where, you know, they should be wholly responsible for the, the downstream impacts of their AI. Um, I saw someone mention something around purchasing or using third-party data sets and then having your AI being traded in those data sets, but they have to return the data after the fact. If, to, from my point of view, if that's a big consideration for you, then I would think to the contract, well, I want to make sure that downstream uses of this data set that I'm using or purchased is not is no way impacted by this agreement, right? Like downstream AI model training purposes have nothing to do with all these other things that I may have agreed with in other parts of the agreement. A question for you, you know, hypothetical. So you wanna build, trade, validate the AI systems using third-party data. So what are some assurances that you want around that data? Um, you know, in what circumstances can you look at third-party data from the web? As an attorney, what are some things that you should be thinking about? And this is a good way of recapping what we kind of discussed up to this point. So number one, you want to look at something that's a really good thing you want to look at is whether the data owner has the rights to give you the data. So it's all good and well to say, hey, I'm going to give you this data, but can you actually do it? Do you have the rights to give me that data? You can't give me something you don't have the rights to give me. So you want to make sure if they're not the ones that generate the data, they have the ability to give you the rights to, to in essence, use that data. We talked about this quite a bit today, privacy. Like, I can't say it enough. Does the data have PI? Is it anonymized? Is it identified? Is there pseudonyms used? Kind of what kind of privacy um, implications are within the data? You need to know the data and know what's in it. That's super important. The next thing, number three, license, 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 the terms of the license, making sure you can use it for your intended purpose. Can it be used for commercial use? Are you using it for non-commercial use? Can it be used for research? Can you modify the data? Super important. Can it be used within an AI model? Those are all things you don't even think about, but that's super important because the data owner may have restrictions on how the data can be used and it may not be able to be used in your particular purpose. The fourth one, which Ndidi um, talked about a little bit here as well, in the, just in the last segment, is in essence, what assurances or identification you have around the data. For example, if you're responsible for the data, this other third party is responsible for the data and something is wrong with the data that affects your model, you have to go back to that third party now and say you're responsible for the issue of the data. Are they going to indemnify you or not in a third party claim? You want to make sure that 
who's responsible for what and accountable for what is taking accountability. Identification is a great way of also making sure accountability is being held on both sides of the fence. So those are four. I mean, there's a wealth of others, but those are the four big ones that um, we should really look at. Circumstances which you can use third-party data from the web. Um, license. You got to look at the license from the data then which you're getting it from. Uh, web, web, getting data from the web can be tricky um, because, you know, obviously license terms can change just like that. Um, and you also have to make sure that, you know, in essence, the license allows you to use it and you're keeping up to date and that data is being used and, and kind of up on a regular basis. So there's a lot of things you got to look at for that. But if your license is, you can use it and you're capturing the data and you're keeping up to date with the data if it's being modified, then generally you have some, you know, potentially you can use it if it works for a particular case, but you've got to be very careful about the terms and the license or the agreement itself. Good thing. Lots to think about. And I think those are good um, four things to th think about. And then as you pull the data, really looking at the license and figuring out where it's coming from is really important as we go through the data. I think we've made it clear through this presentation. They need to really focus on the data and AI is so driven by data um, and looking at some of these issues of bias, confidentiality, transparency, supervision, and ownership. And I want to make sure that we have a couple minutes for questions. So Feel free to add in any questions that you have into the chat and we can ask uh, Nicole and Ndidi any questions that you guys have. And one question that I saw come in was whether the panelists could speak a bit about internal AI ethics panels that your company has. Um, do either of your companies have AI ethics panels or AI ethics reviews teams? And Didi, I know you probably do. Do you want to talk about that one? Yeah, um, so I can talk about, you know, the team that I support is a responsible AI team. And as I mentioned earlier, there I like to call them consultants in this space, and they have a lot of resources and, and guidelines and different like methodologies and tools that will enable um, ethical or responsible AI practices across the company. Um, in general, for example, the EI, the EU AI Act is you know, one of those regulations that we know is coming, it's in draft form right now, but one of the things they are going to require of companies that have certain types of high risk or medium risk level um, models as defined by the by the act is a panel of experts, right? They want um, leadership type level uh, accountability for the AI, the high risk AI that is being used at the company. And that includes a panel um, of different types of, you know, from people across different backgrounds, um, mostly leadership, however, um, that can review a potential high-risk AI application and also decide on what mitigations need to be in place to address or kind of reduce the risk of that AI. So while many companies may not have it today, if, you know, they will have to comply with that act, it is something that is, is coming. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. No, and I, I I could agree with that as well. I think um, even on our end, we have obviously our own, we have, they call it AI ethics board um, in essence, which deals with all the different issues that relate to AI on the privacy level, the legal level, the tech level. Um, so you kind of in essence have a team of, of various experts in different areas to kind of look at um, the AI model and what you're using it for intended purposes and different laws and regulatory landscape that's out there or proposed or soon to come out there and use that as a way to determine, you know, where you should go with your product and what notices should be displayed, and et cetera. It's, it's a whole level of different things that they um, look at. But one thing I do want to point out in the chat, um, someone mentioned whether there's any kind of industry-wide self-regulations besides an internal ethics panel. Um, I know Ndidi mentioned this as well um, to a point. There is no like overarching everyone in big tech is, is this is what we're all agreeing to. There's nothing like that. But if you look at the policies that everyone has, they are very similar. And part of it is we're all a part of the similar boards. We discuss similar issues, maybe not in DD and myself directly, but our, our colleagues do. And in essence, we kind of are somewhat aligning ourselves based upon what you know we, industry standard is and what we're all doing and what we can do at this juncture and what legislatively we're supposed to do and what we're gonna probably be supposed to do within the near future. So all of those things are kind of discussed. So our internal policies are, Eeringly very similar. <laughs> yeah. so. and, I, and I guarantee all our policy folks are part of the same industry groups and exactly. they're talking. And um, I know that we have a lot of roundtables with other, 
you know, policy folks or like regulatory folks across the world. And it's the same people in the room every time. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. thank, thank God for them. <laughs> They're helping <laughs> us. <laughs> and one of the slides, you know, we were talking about all the different policies and regulations. And I think just to that point, you know, you guys can speak to it too, but a lot of them, you know, come through some of the similar themes. So you have the FTC blog post that posted all the, you know, ethical ways to use AI, and then that overlaps with some of the legislation in Europe and the new legislation. Are there any, you know, do you guys see that too as sort of overarching regulatory um, landscape, or is there some laws or, um, you know, areas that seem really far out there and left field that attorneys need to be worried about. Yeah, for, from my point of view, it's quite clear that the FTC, based on that blog post, which was released last year, and they released a report earlier this year, they definitely are caring about uh, discrimination across protected characteristics, kind of in particular to like housing, employment type situations, but also like de deceptive practices, like consumer practices, unfair business practices, that type of thing. So I, I mean, it's it's thought that there would you, they will use these type of things that we all know the FTC has has typically like I guess prosecuted or, or looked out for to apply to the more um, newer in, innovation. So I think it's just something to be aware of. You know, just they they've talked about discrimination by an algorithm to provide you know like I mentioned housing or, or credit opportunities. And so I mean, it's, I think it's just a matter of time till they expand the definitions rather than passing a brand new law they're just going to find a way to for it to apply <laughs> to everything <laughs> and just piggybacking off of that that's a good segue into the ai algorithmic accountability act um, of 2022 that was just proposed in the house and the senate in the u.s um in february of this year um they, a big chunk of that act in the U.S. is in essence giving the FTC more say or give it, make the, the regulatory body for AI models. So in essence, giving the FTC the role that it's kind of taken on, you know, indirectly, but kind of giving it that particular role and the resources to, in essence, make sure that different companies are, in essence, looking at um, how their particular AI model is impacting users and customers, whether they're deploying or developing. And that's super important because, in essence, kind of giving the FTC a little more, you know, a little more of a role, but it's also kind of something that's actually a probably a plausible law that may actually get some kind of traction here. So just kind of keeping it all in mind, it's all interconnected in some way as well. Um, so you have to look at that as far as building proposals as well in the upcoming landscape as well in this area. One question, another switching gears a little bit, one question that I saw come in was related to privacy issues and whether you're using data for research versus commercial purposes. Um, is there a distinction there about how you're using data for research versus commercial? Could you talk a little bit about that? Yeah, there is a very clear distinction, um, you know, especially within a company, if you, in essence, have one group that does only research and one group only commercial, you try to make the lines very clear, because if you're using it for, for research purposes, that means, in essence, you might be a part of academia, that's a whole nother separate of use than if you're using it to market it for a profit or for monetary reasons. So we do, keep, most companies keep the two very separate. And if you look at the license terms, they also make a clear distinction. Usually when they use research, they use non-commercial along with it as well, or research in academia. So that also makes a very clear distinction that it's not a for-profit or commercial offering is what's gonna be derived from this particular data. So there is a distinction. And is there a concern or is there a thought about the research eventually turning into commercial um, use or is that are they still pretty separate? No need to worry about that. It depends on what what happens from the research. If the research in essence is, is research for a particular drug that later on is going to be a commercial product, then you in essence, before you can make that research become a commercial product, you have to get you know, in essence, clearance from the data owners or whoever you got this information from that led that started the research to actually use it for a commercial offering in some way, shape, and or form. They may want royalties. Who knows? So the whole point is you need to be, you need to kind of in essence seek that permission as well before you in essence turn this research intended use into now a commercial intended use. Yes. 
I don't see too many other chat questions coming in. I think we can wrap up. If Nicole and Indeed, do you want to give one final takeaway for ethical use of AI before we head out? I sure. Can, you oh. want to go ahead, Indeed? You go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, for me, um, starting is the biggest thing. Like I mentioned, this is not necessarily an area that our engineers that are, you know, we're building these things is we're taught in school. So mm -hmm. either you're introducing them through your company or company's practices, or you're inquiring about them as you're purchasing services from somebody that's providing you AI. You just have to start because when the regulations come, everyone will be behind if they haven't. And mm -hmm. so um, it's, it's to me, just start starting some type of ethical AI related practice at your company, or like I mentioned, a company you're purchasing from is the biggest Thing, knowing how your product, if they currently exist and use AI, knowing how they work for across, you know, different users is also important. And that's how you actually deliver an effective service. Mm -hmm. So just starting is to me the biggest takeaway. Mm -hmm. Agreed. And I will say no one is an island. So you need to not only do you need to be very mindful of where you're starting, you need to get a team of people around you who are experts as well. Um, nobody can know everything. You can't know, you know, import export um, privacy. <laughs> like you, you can't know everything. Um, so you, in essence, have to get to around. They're all experts who can help you make those decisions. The reality is we're in a space where it's new. Um, a lot of things are new. It's emerging technology. So the laws have not caught up to what the development level is at. Let's be honest here. So the reality is we really have a team around of us that can in essence think about what's coming down the pipeline, think about what's here and help you advise your clients, give your clients the best advice based upon what we know and what we think is going to happen in the future and looking at that risk assessment as well is super important because that's that's in essence a huge part of, of our jobs. And the last thing I want to say, not to be the person beating data with the stick at this point, data, 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 you know, when dealing with AI models, you must always be very meticulous about the data that you're using and where you're getting that data from and, and whether you have the rights to use that data, because that is the heart of the model. And anyone who's in this space can tell you it is very hard when you have data in your AI model that you should not have to take it back out. It is it is a very hard and some cases almost impossible situation. So you gotta be very careful of what data you're putting in and what you're getting from that data and where that data is coming from. If nothing else, that's <laughs> one big thing I wanted as a takeaway. Great, thank you so much. Thank you guys for being on the panel. I think we all thank learned you. a lot from the nuts and bolts of AI to some consideration. So thank you guys. Thank you. All three of you are rock star panel for delivering such a fantastic presentation. The chat box was super active, lots of questions. We actually have one more question, if that's okay. We're in, you know, over time. Um, what about data ag uh, aggregation, anonymization, pseudonymization um, to protect data that gets processed and shared to AI? Is this enough? Aggregation of data can be undone. What about others when, you know, negotiating AI and contracts? Any thoughts on that? Go ahead. Go ahead, Indeed. Do you have any? There are, so in this type of AI, ethical AI, understanding how your systems work type space, there are a number of privacy enhancing technologies, pets for short, that different companies are using to enable not just these like collection of this of sensitive data um, that does, you know, provide strong encryption and anonymization and the identification but also ensures that you actually never will hold the data yourself as an entity, right? So these, these technologies exist. Um, there are a lot of companies, I would say starter, smaller companies, maybe startups that are that focus their entire business on this in this space. So as you know, folks are seeking to do more and more of this type of sensitive type of measurement and not actually storing the data, I think you'll be able to find more and more of like opportunities to purchase this type of, or use these type of like uh, technologies. But I also wanted to mention this one other thing and I can't remember what it is anymore, but if I do, I will <laughs> sit in the chat. Well, I will say one thing while you think about what you're gonna say. It also comes down to what you're using a data for. I think there's a lot of techniques out there, whether you wanna use a pseudonym or whether you wanna anonymize or whether you wanna de-identify the data or any other technique out there but you gotta be also comfortable using a data for. If a big chunk of the data does require PI, like an address, 
you know, you need to get certain consents behind using it for that particular purpose. So it also, you know, it's the, all the techniques are out there, but you also have to look at what the data is being used for. And if idea identifying everything is really what you need to do in order to make the data useful, because if it's not useful, then it doesn't really matter if it's PI or not. It's just not useful. I remember now what is the identification and what is anonymization will vary mm -hmm. by law. So you want to actually look at what the, the underlying law requires or, you know, case law has mm -hmm. come out to decide because that is where a lot of, you know, people may get tripped up because they may think they had adequately de-identified where there actually really is no one definition, for example, for anonymization. Mm -hmm. there, there just isn't. And I, if you talk to an engineer, they won't be able to tell you what it is but it's your best approach at it and whether you will be sued or not on it depends on the jurisdiction and their own definition or interpretation of what it is. Exactly. And with health, with HIPAA, for example, healthcare information, there's a different process for idea de-identifying or, de or anonymizing that data as opposed to data being used for, you know, banking. So that is super important as well. Good point, Didi. I think everybody did a great job and it was a fantastic panel. So thank you, Baker Botts. Thank you, Maggie, Nicole, and Ndidi for your fantastic presentation and answering all the many questions.